Howdy folks, welcome back to part two of the Chevy Craptiva, I mean Captiva. Last time we got the old destroyed engine out, and we had a look at the damage from the outside. This time we're gonna have a look at the damage from the inside, and then we're gonna go ahead and th throw a new or used engine in its place. And hopefully by the end of the video, the, the Craptiva, I mean Captiva, will be running and driving under its own power. So I had a lot of comments from the last video. A lot of people were questioning my judgment and wondering why on earth I would buy a used 2012 Chevy Captiva with a broken engine. And yeah, I can tell you that there's a perfectly logical, reasonable explanation for that. Hey, can you not help me with this real fast? Oh, hold on, folks. I don't know. All right, folks, I had to help the missus for a minute. Uh, let's get to work. I think we established that this old engine has some major problems here and here and there and pretty much everywhere. So I bought a new engine. That was not easy to do. This global pandemic virus deal has really got things screwed up. I ordered a new engine on Friday, a week ago today, and that was before we even pulled the old engine out. I knew it was bad. The salvage yard where I ordered it, had one from a similar similar vehicle, similar year, similar miles, $1,600, 30-day warranty against any defect, including burning oil. So I ordered the engine. They were going to pull it out on Monday, and I was going to pick it up on Tuesday morning. Uh, Tuesday afternoon rolled around. I still hadn't heard from them. Finally gave them a call, and I guess basically what happened is they they processed my order, but before they actually got the engine pulled out of the vehicle, they sent everybody home because of the virus. So there was nobody there to take it out. You know, it was still available, still reserved for me, but you know, fat lot of good that did. So basically there's no end in sight on that. They had no idea when they were gonna be opened back up. So I called another salvage yard a little bit further away. They had an engine. It was quite a bit more expensive. The first one I looked at was $1,600. This one was $2,000 but it has half the miles. This only has 80,000 miles. Came out of the same year car. I'm not sure what it was, a Verano or something. Anyway, same thing. Uh, also, this is a complete engine, so it comes with the coils, the VBTI solenoids, intake, throttle body, everything is there. So that's good. Also, there's no core charge on the old block, so we don't have to take that thing all the way back up there. I'm happy with that, just a little bit more than what I wanted to spend. And th the whole deal was kind of super sketchy the salvage yards in Iowa they would not take my out-of-state check under any circumstances so I had to pay for this with cash I show up there there's a sign on the door basically saying you cannot come inside you have to call them they'll bring you the parts and a receipt you hand them the money and it's all you know social distancing or whatever feels like a weird daytime meeting with a drug dealer but at least we got the engine also bought some parts uh, no problem at the local parts store to get parts so far. I got exhaust manifold gaskets, intake manifold gaskets, which we, which we probably won't need. A new serpentine belt, some Dex Kill, and some Dexos oil. And we should have everything we need here to put the thing back together. I also bought a new air box top. The two tabs here on the old one were broken off. That's where your air filter bolts up. So you'll never get a good seal there. It needs to be replaced. I did not need this part here, but they, I guess it was included as part of the deal, which is good because uh, this one's cracked a little bit on one side, so we'll go ahead and replace that. about that. 
The cylinder head's fine. It did not hit a valve. So, yeah. That could probably be made to run again. However, don't think this cylinder's going to make it. Oh. Well, there's what's left of the piston. Yeah, that's not good. Well, the cylinder wall really doesn't look too bad. I'm sure it won't show up on the camera, but there's really no ridge at the top. I don't know, it doesn't look that bad to me. There's something right there. I don't know what that is. A piece of a rod bolt or something wedged between the, the crankshaft and the bottom of the block and then the that throw on the crank is just totally shot Oh boy. So now that I flipped the block over, you can really see the block's broken out into the balance shaft cavity on both sides. So the shiny thing you see on both sides there is the balance shafts. And you can see how nasty the crankshaft is. That thing's junk. And then the whole bottom skirt here, girdle of the block, is broken several places. <laughs> Underneath that little baffle tray, there's our oil ring spacer. One of the connecting rod bolts. The other connecting rod bolt. Oh, interesting that the bolts did not fail. The actual rod itself broke. So that's no good. There's part of the I beam of our connecting rod. And then everything else in the bottom is just what's left of the piston. So it's it's completely gone. Just shattered into a million pieces. Uh, some pieces of the rings are still here. Rod bushing is still intact. Rod pin still looks pretty good. Also kind of find it interesting that this oil pan casting was made in Israel. Huh. I'm pretty sure this is what's left of the one of the rod bearing shells. That there's nothing left of it. It's been cooked all the Babbitt material is missing so this is I think this is our smoking gun yeah it had a bad rod bearing and it finally just it finally had enough and let go okay we're gonna try to fix this exhaust manifold so I had a lot of guys suggest that I try to weld it while it was bolted up to the head but unfortunately it's cracked all the way down to the flange there so there's no way I can it would be very difficult for me to reach that with it mounted on the engine. I'd have to actually weld upside down. So I went ahead and pulled it off and I drilled out. Well, is it cracked in two places? Hang on, folks. Okay, sorry about that. I thought maybe it was cracked right here, but that's just the way that it's cast. Anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the thing and just, I'll, I'll bolt the, converter flange down to the welding table here. That way we can be sure that it's, you know, mostly flat. And then we'll we'll take a shot at brazing it. Uh, nickel welding would probably be better, you know, be a better process, but I'm a lot better at brazing than I am at nickel welding. So we're gonna try brazing first. I've had good luck brazing exhaust manifolds. Uh, even though it's kind of a low temperature welding process, 
you know, they don't get that hot. Maybe in a, a turbocharged, like high performance turbocharged application, that wouldn't be suitable, but for, you know, a normal street car, brazing will be just fine. So I drilled out the end of the cracks on both ends. I'm just going to V it out with a carbide burr, and then we'll take a crack at brazing it. Okay, I think that'll do. Yeah, our exhaust manifold came out okay, I think. That brazing never looks as good once you get the slag broken off of it, but I think it'll be just fine. So I have the heat a little bit high up here at the top. This is thinner than what I expected it to be, but I think it'll be all right. I kind of got the recipe right by the time I got down here to the bottom of the crack, so no worries. It'll probably crack again. These all crack. The one on the engine I bought that has only 80,000 miles already cracked. And then I used the sandblast cabinet here just to clean up the flanges and everything looks pretty good. Yeah. Alright, we gotta straighten this bracket out. This is what holds that weird little vacuum pump on the front of the engine. So some somebody hooked a toe strap to it. Uh, this leg's supposed to be straight. I'm sure of that and then this part here is supposed to be straight so we gotta straighten that out and then I don't know if you'll be able to see this see that power steering line right there oh baby some tow truck driver did a number on that thing too so I think it'll be alright that's the return side but if not we'll have to splice that back together Well, that's better. All right, that'll work. Put a couple bolts in it and it'll self-correct. Yeah, we better run a tap through these holes though because I don't think there were any bolts in there. So we'll do that while the engine's out. Be a little bit easier. All right, I had a surprising number of comments about dropping the engine out the bottom instead of pulling it out the top. Everybody seems to think that's the way to go. That's the preferred method. It's quicker, faster, easier, better. 
and that pulling it out the top is a mistake. I'll tell you why I don't like to do that. The biggest reason is that no matter what you do, you're going to have to break the strut loose somewhere. So you can either take it loose at the top, up here where the swivel bearing is, you can crack it loose here at these two bolts, or you can break the lower ball joint loose and pull the axle out. However you want to do it, you've got to take this all loose. And in my opinion, when you put that back together, you're going to have to have the alignment checked. Because, you know, there's nothing that really centers that engine cradle in there. And all your steering and everything is, is based on that, the location of the engine cradle. The suspension is mounted right to it. And, you know, you're, you're affecting the camber, no matter what you do. So, in my opinion, you have to have the alignment checked after you do a bottom-out engine swap. I'm sure people will argue with me about that, but to do it right, that's what you have to do. Now, the other reason I don't like to do that has to do with these big bolts. So, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Yeah, there it is right there. So, the engine cradle is held in by these great big bolts that go through some, you know, big mounting washers, and sometimes there's rubber bushings, and sometimes there's not. Anyway, they go into welded nuts in the bottom of the, basically, the unibody frame of the car. Now, a long time ago, when I was a young pup, I was working at a car dealership, and a guy... It wasn't me, but another guy there was taking an engine out. I think it was a V6 in a Pontiac. Might have been a Grand Prix or something. I, I can't remember. It's been a long time ago. Anyway, one of the welded nuts in the subframe broke loose and was spinning inside of the subframe. And it turned, you know, what would normally be a three-hour job into a whole day affair. So anyway, I guess that's why I kind of prefer to pull them out the top. But, you know, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying that that's what I did. All right, we're ready to install the engine, I think. Everything's switched over. Really wasn't hardly anything to switch over. Everything is the same. I went ahead and cleaned up the back of the head there for the exhaust manifold. Like I said, we have a new gasket for that. This pulley is the same. These two pulleys are the same. I'm going to try to install it with the intake manifold on. We'll see if that works. I don't know if I'll have enough room. But if I had to take the intake manifold off, then I'll have to use those intake manifold gaskets, and I'd rather just leave well enough alone. I did also clean up the flange here, just so we don't get any kind of weird misalignment. Well, I cleaned up the bell housing there on the transmission, and then I got to apologize to the GM engineers about that power steering pump. If I would have opened my eyes, I would have realized that the bolts can come out right through those holes in the pulley, so there's no need to actually pull the pulley off to get the power steering pump off. Could have had it off there in 15 seconds. I just I don't know, I didn't see that. Alright, it's in. Super easy. You want to know how easy this engine is to install? I was able to do it in less than the time that it took my wife to get bored of playing outside. I wasn't, I wasn't playing outside. I was doing yard work. We don't have trees. How can you pick up sticks? We have a tree in our front yard. We have lots of trees. They're so small though. The peanut gallery is here. Hey everybody. Oh, it's gotta go that way. here for it.
All right, so I kind of screwed up here on this support bracket for the CV, the, the axle shaft here, half shaft. I should have indexed this before I dropped, the, while I was dropping the engine in, but I forgot to do that. Luckily, this car is from Oklahoma, so I just zipped the three bolts out of that bearing, and now I can put it wherever I want to. Well, I'm going to go ahead and install the old catalytic converter. I don't know if it's any good or not. I would say that for sure the car was burning oil, so I think we just roll the dice, put it on, and we'll have to drive it for a while to know if we're going to get the, the dreaded PO420 or if it's going to be okay. I got a new crush ring that goes up here on the flange to the exhaust manifold, and then a new gasket to go from the flex pipe here to the rest of the exhaust. Now remember we broke broke one of the studs off in that flange so I just drove it out and we'll replace it with a regular M10 bolt so no big deal there. So I figure putting the catalytic converter into the sandblast cabinet probably isn't a good idea so I just used the needle scaler here to clean up the flanges. Uh, really this is the only one that matters. The top one here is all sealed by that crush ring so you don't have to go crazy with that. Plus, I think that's probably stainless since it's part of the converter. Okay, exhaust installed. Back on the little hanger here. Got the myriad of GM add-on brackets reinstalled. Now, if somebody can explain this to me, I'd love to know what was going on. Somehow they decided they needed to put this divot in the bottom of the exhaust here. I'm sure that's a factory bend. That's not something that somebody did by hitting something. So they could give themselves, what? half a hand width of clearance between the brace and this exhaust. But right there where this add-on aluminum bracket is, what do you need? Maybe 40 thousandths clearance to the axle shaft? I just don't know. This bracket is quite a work of art there. They just, GM really phoned this in. Well, it turns out that the alternator down here is a lot easier to install when you, you know what you're doing. Okay, fellas, I think we're out of stuff to do on the bottom. I got the starter motor put back in. This little gizmo with our freshly straightened bracket. AC compressor is hooked back up. I drained out whatever little bit of oil was left in the engine. I think we're ready to set it down and finish up up top. There's that power steering return line. I don't think that'll hurt anything, but it's not ideal. Somebody must have wrapped a hook or a chain around that at one time. All right, up top I've got to straighten out the wiring harness, get everything plugged back in, reinstall the battery and the upper and lower radiator hoses, and then we should be able to try and run it. This is honestly the stupidest, stupidest oil filter design I've ever seen. I guess I should break down and buy the special socket for it. What a joke. I know what you're saying. You're saying, I can't even see that oil filter. I know. Nobody can. It's not a camera trick. The freaking thing is buried. There it is. God forbid they have a spin-on filter like the, the V6 does. Oh yeah, baby. Well, if any of you out there watching this video are aspiring automotive design engineers, here's a, here's a little tip for you. 
If you need to have a special service tool to remove an oil filter, you're doing something wrong. Very, very wrong. Are you listening to me, Ford? Oh, man. What if I have an angle wrench that size? I do. See? All this tool hoarding is going to pay off someday. Oh, but I suppose it's too long, isn't it? Well, shizzle. Now we're back to the old southern socket set here. I don't know why I didn't do this while the engine was out. Because that would have been too smart, huh? Okay. I guess we better put some cooling in the old girl. Oh, this never goes well. You want to draw the ire of YouTube commenters. Try running an engine without some without topping off the coolant first. Well, should we see if it's going to run? We should have everything we need. We got oil, coolant, electricity. Put the battery back in. There should be fuel. I hooked the fuel line back up. Uh, that should be enough to make it go. It's going to be kind of mad at us because the MAF, the mass airflow sensor is not plugged in. There's no serpentine belt, so we're not going to have any alternator. Uh, what else? I guess that's the only thing that it should be really mad about. But it should run without those, so let's see what happens. Pretty hard to complain about that. Sounds good. Put the rest of it back together. Well, I cleaned the throttle body real quick with some of this CRC throttle body cleaner. It wasn't too bad, but it should go through a relearn. This is a throttle by wire system, so it should go through a whole relearn on the throttle. So we'll give it We'll give it the best chance at doing a proper relearn by cleaning that out. You know, again, like what was GM, you know, the GM design team smoking when they came up with this air box? Like they couldn't move this screw out a few millimeters so you could actually put a tool on it. I mean, all the other ones are out in the open. I guess. Nobody ever changes the air filter anyway.
All right, thanks, assistant. You're welcome. Alrighty, got all the fancy bits put back on. I think that's it. I topped off the oil. We'll run it for a while and then top off the coolant. Should be good to go. Wah, wah, wah. Well, some smart guy left the key on, so the battery's dead. Of course, the battery did sit on the concrete floor for like what, six days? So, it may be a lost cause. So far, so good. Got brakes. No check engine light. Runs good. Shifts through all the gears. Feels pretty solid. Steering is tight. Yeah, I think we got a winner. May have a bad TPS sensor. I don't know, I thought it would have gone out by now. I checked the tires, the tires are all filled. Yeah, you know, they're all good. So, we'll have to investigate that. See if reverse works. Another beautiful March day here in Illinois. Yeah. All right, guys, I think we got a winner. The fear always is that you're going to have a bad transmission because you can't, you can't test that without the engine running. So I think we got lucky here. Well, it's got an oil change sticker here. You guys probably can't read it, but it says next change. Uh, what? June of last year at 156,000 miles. And it has currently a hundred and basically 159,000 miles. So it's only 3,000 miles overdue for an oil change. That's, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's not that bad. So I don't know. seems like maybe they were keeping up with their maintenance. They just let the, let the oil level get too low. But it doesn't matter now. Fixed. All right, folks, there you go. Chevy Craptiva back on the road. This is the part of the video where I do the, I do the Watch JR Go walk around where I tell you that this car that I've literally spent three minutes driving is, is perfect. It's perfect inside. Most perfect. It smells perfect. It's not perfect. No, just kidding. Works perfectly. Everything's always perfect. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't give me a bunch of hateful comments. He's a good guy. But truthfully, it really isn't too bad of a car. Most of this black plastic is pretty faded. A lot of the fake chrome on the plastic is also peeling off. I would categorize that as a typical Oklahoma problem. You know, they have a lot more sun and a lot more heat than what we do. We don't usually see those problems here. Even on the interior, like the chrome on the shift knob is, is peeling off. Uh, the front tires are pretty worn. The back tires really aren't too bad. I am not going to put tires on it, but that will hurt the value a little bit. It's got quite a few dents on the top, probably from hail. It's got a little dent here in the hood. I noticed a pretty decent dent there in the fender. 
There's one pretty good one in the passenger side door. Uh, where else? I think there's a couple here in the the rear door on the passenger side. Uh, there's some body fitment issues. I'd say the previous owners, they may have had a dog. Uh, what do you guys think? It's a possibility. Well, the interior really isn't too bad. Nothing's broken or torn. The driver's seat has some wear on it, and they're both a little bit dirty, but it really just needs to be cleaned. You know, you kind of lose your motivation to clean your car out when it's got a rod hanging out of the engine block. Well, in all seriousness, guys, I'll show you why I bought this car. Look how clean it is. So there's the brake caliper and caliper bracket. They still have the original plating on them. All these fasteners look like the day they rolled off the assembly line. Plastic's in pretty good shape. Same thing on the other side. The brakes are pretty good. Exhaust, barely rusted. Subframe, completely solid. But check this out. Fuel lines, brake lines, still with the factory plating, factory paint. I mean, there's not a speck of rust on those brake lines anywhere. A tiny bit of rust on the rear suspension, probably just from all the rock chips. But look how clean this thing is underneath. We just, this is an eight year old car. We don't see anything like this in Illinois. It just doesn't happen. Look at the hanger on the exhaust, not even rusted. I bet I could take any one of these bolts out without breaking it, without heating it, without using oil. Just take them out. And that just, just does not happen around here. All right, folks, there you have it. How to fix your Chevy Craptiva. If you've got a 2.4 liter Ecotec engine that's had a minor disagreement between the connecting rod and the crankshaft, this is how you fix it. You tear it out and you put in another one. So a lot of guys were asking for a cost breakdown. And, you know, a lot of people on YouTube are pretty cagey about revealing what they paid for things. And, you know, I understand that. It's really nobody's business. But I don't have a problem telling you guys. I paid $700 for this car with a clean title. I spent $2,050 at the salvage yard to buy the engine and the airbox. And then I spent about another, I don't know, $45 at the auto parts store buying the gaskets and coolant and oil and stuff that we needed to swap this engine out. So I'm all in on this car for about $2,800. And my total time invested, including going to pick up the engine and going to pick up the car, is about 10 or 11 hours. So I don't think we're going to keep this one. I'm going to try to flip it. And I'm going to ask somewhere in the $5,000 to $5,500 range. If I get anything above $4,000 for it, I'm going to be in the black. You know, even though it's front-wheel drive, these little crossover SUVs are really popular where I live, so I don't think it'll be a problem to sell it. We just may have to sit on it for a little while because of, you know, what's going on right now in the world. But that's okay. We don't have a whole lot invested, so I think we'll get it back eventually.